Well, I suppose that we can go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming to my lecture recital today. I'm very pleased to see so many faces in this crowd. Um, my name is Nick Stark, if you don't know me, and I'm going to be presenting today on the songs of Spain in the 1800s, and particularly those of the composer Fermin Maria Avaré. A little bit about my own Spanish experience and why I chose this topic. Um, I was a Spanish minor in my undergrad, um, and my teachers were Panamanian and Argentinian, so you'll forgive me if I go back and forth a little between Spanish pronunciations, South American pronunciations, and the United States of American pronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason that I chose this composer in particular, or even just this topic in particular, is because every source that I come across seems to think that there just was no good music coming out of Spain in the 1800s. One of the books that I came across just nearly said that verbatim, and I just didn't believe that. I just didn't believe it. And so I have proof of that for you today. So without further ado, let's get into it. I would like to start with a history lesson first. So most of us are familiar with the American Revolution of 1776. Generally, this was a fairly successful revolution for us. Yes, it was bloody and it was a war, but generally it went over pretty smoothly. The French Revolution came shortly after. Um, they were a bit inspired by our antics, I think, and unfortunately, it was a little less of a smooth transition compared to the American Revolution. So the French Revolution triggered a lot of things and feelings, particularly in the more tyrannical governments of Europe in the late 1700s. Places like Russia were forcing their French, the French people within their borders to completely um, disavow the actions of France and of the French revolutionaries. Um, Austria was essentially removing its freedom of speech rights for people. And Spain was also had a lot going on for it. So Carlos IV was in power at this time. He was on the Spanish throne. And his son, Fernando VII, really wanted the Spanish throne, and they were fighting for it all the time. So both of them approached Napoleon Bonaparte and said, hey, will you help me get this throne? I want to be the one in power. And Napoleon basically said to them, yeah, you guys wait here, and I will go back to Spain, and I will get you the throne. And so Napoleon goes into Spain with the French army and simply occupies the country and puts his own brother onto the throne of Spain. Obviously, the Spanish people were not happy about this, and so they revolted immediately, and we call this the Spanish War of Independence. For six years, the Spaniards fought this war against the French, and they slowly destroyed the French army. Quote unquote, King Joseph was finally deposed in 1814 and they were very happy to put Fernando VII back on the, or onto the throne. He, I don't really know why because I don't think he was very good at his job, it would turn out. A few years earlier during the Spanish War of Independence, there had been a constitution drafted in the region of Cadiz, which you'll see on a map soon. But Fernando promptly ignored this constitution and he was not interested, but rather he was more interested in tyranny and corruption. Freedom of speech was just non-existent in Spain during this time. Poverty and crime were everywhere. They were normal. In 1820, the people revolted against King Fernando, and the Spanish military was like, hey, remember this constitution? We're going to do this now. Pay attention. Um, and then three years later, the French were like, hey, I think you forgot about our friends, and put Fernando right back onto the throne. Thank you, France. So Fernando finally dies in 1833, um, and his three-year-old daughter Isabel takes over the throne, or Isabel if you prefer. She rules for over 30 years, and it just was a lot for Queen Isabel, yes. There were civil wars, there were drafts of constitutions being made, there were independent governments being formed, there were military uprisings. It was just tumultuous. The rest of Europe was modernizing. Education was being reformed, economies were thriving, freedom of religion was abounding, but Spain was just a little behind during this time period. There were people in Spain at this time fighting for these reforms and fighting for these positive effects, but it just wasn't as widespread there as it was in the rest of Spain. 
1868, there was a military coup which forced Isabel out of the country, and she's gone. So, with Isabel gone, the, king, the brother of the king of Italy at the time, Amadeo de Savoia, comes in and becomes the constitutional king. He leaves after just two years and leaves behind a little bit more put together Spanish parliament who declares the First Republic, First Republic of Spain. This republic exists, again, for just two years. And then the monarchy is reinstated and we get Isabel's son, Alfonso XII, who comes in and becomes the constitutional king. Now, up to this point, Spain has had sort of a bad time with the monarchy, yes? But thankfully, Alfonso XII is going to come in and do a little bit of a better job. He's going to honor the Constitution, he's going to promote order in the country, um, and he'll die just 10 years later, in 1885. When he dies, his wife Maria Cristina becomes the regent, um, and if you're unfamiliar with royal affairs, that just means that she would act on behalf of their young son, Alfonso XIII, how creative, um, and she would just basically act on his behalf until he was old enough to take the throne. So while she was regent, she promoted peace, she modernized the government, she encouraged writers and thinkers to flourish, and just generally pushed, gave Spain that push that it needed to sort of catch up with the rest of Europe, and that launches us into the, 19th, the 1900s, which is beyond our scale today. So, what effect did this time period have on the musicians in and out of Spain? Well, a lot of them had to leave. It's like if you're familiar with the hierarchy of needs, the physical needs and like being alive are way more basic than like music and spiritual needs and like that sort of thing. So, people were dying and so no one was interested in hearing classical music or music of any kind, or Peruvian <coughs> art, or anything like that. So you had artists being exiled from Spain, or putting themselves into exile, because they wanted money, they wanted to be appreciated, they wanted to be heard, and everywhere else in Europe had those things. Europe had audiences, so they went. Spanish composers were premiering their works everywhere but Spain, right? Salons, bars, concert halls, any performance venue that you can think of during this time, in England, France, Germany, they were everywhere, except Spain, in most cases. French and English publishing houses even found Spanish music quite lucrative and were publishing these composers' scores. They were creating translations of them into English, into French, into all of the languages that we sort of commonly associate with classical music. So really, Spanish music was all over Europe, and we hear this influence in our non-Spanish composers quite clearly, I think. Now, let's have a geography lesson. This is Spain. Um, some of these regions are maybe familiar to you, and some may not be. But generally, the ones that you may have heard of, for example, if you can see my cursor up there, this is Galicia, which if you attended Ben M's recital, you may have heard a little bit about that. Um, over here we have Aragon in the purple which is the region in which our composer today, Alvarez, was born, particularly in Zaragoza. We have Catalonia, to the far northeast, which contains Barcelona, and also Gerona, which was the actual, uh, which was where Alvarez spent most of his childhood. Not to mention Madrid, in the very center, of course. Andalusia, in the far south, this red. Andalusia, meant a lot to many of these artists, I think. Um, you, may be, you may have heard of Cordoba, Sevilla, Cadiz. This is where the constitution that I mentioned was drafted. Granada will be mentioned in the songs that you'll hear today. And in fact, Andalusia as a whole, I said that it was important to, to many of these poets, but you'll also hear and perhaps read references to it a lot in the songs that you'll hear today. Um, of note is that France was right there. So when Alvarez was growing up here in Gerona, Paris was just directly north. And we can see that here. Um, and I'll talk about this in a minute. But his family and he would go to Paris yearly. And of course they did, because it was right there. So when I was researching this topic, I ran into some things. First of all, I found that a lot of things 
and a lot of information is published in Spanish and in Spain, and there are no English translations of a lot of this information. So at first, I just simply thought that there was no information on this composer, and I believed what many of my English sources told me, which was that there just were no composers in 1800 Spain. I believed it. But then I would come to realize that that is not necessarily the case, because I ran across Suzanne Rhodes Dreyer's Art Song Composers of Spain, colon, an encyclopedia, <laughs> which was the first, and as far as I can tell, only English publication that lists this man's name with anything more than one sentence after it. And so she has an entire chapter that is his biography and information from everywhere. And so, thank you, Suzanne, you have saved my life. <laughs> All of my scores come from IMSLP, if you're familiar with that, or the National Library of Spain. The, the scans are bad quality. They were hard to read. Um, I had to do a lot of extrapolation and like, is this a word in Spanish? To see if it was even, if I was even getting it right. And bless Joanne for reading through all of the things that are in those scores. But there are just no modern publications of these songs, right? And I don't know anything about <laughs> copyright law. And certainly I don't know anything about it in Spain. Unfortunately, I of course have a lot of sources as well that just were informative about the romantic communities in Europe in the 1800s, the networking that was going on. If you're familiar with the romantic period at all in Europe, you know that everyone knew everyone in, in individual countries as well as across countries. I mean, like I just briefly mentioned, Alvarez himself was in Paris and in Spain, and many of our favorite composers are all over Europe. They all know each other. Poets, composers, librettists, they are all connected. And Spain was a part of that connection. Um, when I first began this project, naturally the first place I went was Wikipedia. Because I know that, at least in high school, like, you know, teachers tell you, don't go to Wikipedia for your sources. But listen, it's a great place to get an overview of somebody's biography, right? So I went, and what did I find? But his name, and one sentence after. So I said, well, that's not very helpful. And then I discovered that if you change the language on Wikipedia, there's a whole entire page on him. Hello, are you kidding me? And so naturally I went and translated it into English. <laughs> and so now you can go and read about his life. There's more translation work that I want to do on this page. Um, I've translated his entire biography, but there are still some sections that go a little more in depth into his works and his compositions that I hope to translate and finish out the article and maybe do some grammatical touching up, because, you know, translation is never a clean business. So, that was exciting to come across. Without further ado, let's get into who this man was. Hermín María Álvarez was not only a musician, but a lawyer, and a composer, and an amateur pianist. Many musicians in the Romantic period, well, I'll say this. To me, Romantic music is characterized both by virtuosity and a draw to the amateur. It's paradoxical in that way, and Alvarez was no different. He was best known for chamber music, particularly pieces for solo piano and piano and voice, like you'll hear today. Um, he was also well-renowned for the salons that he hosted on the Calle de Fuencarral in Madrid. Um, and if you don't know what a salon was, it just basically was where a lot of people would come and hang out, and they would share food, poetry, art, music, compositions, opera scenes, you name it. And it was sort of the catalyst of this networking that I have mentioned. Like I have said, he went to Paris every year and he mingled with many of these musicians that we have come to know well in the classical music community. Like I said earlier, he was born in Zaragoza, in the region of Aragon. He moved as a young boy to Gerona, where he began his formal musical training Unfortunately, there just isn't much information about his actual childhood and his youth. Um, from my brief experience in deep historical research, it's just really hit or miss whether or not there's information on people as children. Because like, do newspapers write about children? I mean, I guess you're lucky if like, their parents maybe keep diaries about them raising their own children. But other than that, it's just, it's very hit or miss. And in this case, we have a miss, at least for now. <clears throat> Eventually, Alvarez moved to Madrid and settled down with his soon-to-be wife, Eulalia Goicorotea, who was a well-known soprano of excellence, and also a daughter of aristocrats, 
which is really lucky for Alvarez in a country which is in economic turmoil and where artists are having to leave left and right. So luckily, because Alvarez had this money connection now, he was able to stay in Madrid. He became a philanthropist. He worked to fund younger composers and younger musicians, giving them a space to be performed in this just uproarious time in Spain's history. His salons were attended by singers, poets, musicians, every kind of artist, everything even adjacent to artists. They were coming to these salons. Everyone knew about them. For a time, he, later in his life, he worked as a jury member at the Madrid Conservatory, along with many of the other um, musicians that he was in contact with, and he overall just helped promote and revitalize the musical life in Madrid during this time. Um, I don't think that the body of his works are documented particularly well, but we know that he wrote an opera, we know that he wrote sacred and secular works, we know that he wrote piano works, and we know that he wrote a lot of songs. We also know that he translated and reorchestrated Gounod's Le Médecin Malgré Lui, which was a, um, a comic opera of Gounod's. So that's great. I also wanted to include a list of just people that he interacted with. Many of these are Spanish musicians, but some of them are South American. They're from the United States, like Gottschalk, if you're a piano person. Um, there are a few particularly familiar names to me down at the bottom who, again, he fraternized with on his trips to France and Paris, and I'm sure that they also visited Spain as well. Rossini's wife was Isabel Cobran, who was Spanish. I just think that, to me, it's very important to recognize, given the state of the body of research um, regarding sp Spanish music in this period, that the network existed, <laughs> right? The network that we talk about in France and in Germany and in England existed in Spain, and it was there. It didn't just black out for a hundred years. We have people, people are writing music, people are creating poetry, it's there. It just is waiting to be discovered, yes? There were several things as well that I am looking forward to seeing more research done in, whether this is by me or from another scholar. Um, first of all, one of my sources told me that songs from across Spain have different stylistic expectations, just as we would expect from anywhere, right? There are just certain things that should be done in songs from northern Spain that should not be done in songs from southern Spain, for example. Um, and I just think that's really interesting and it should be looked into. Like I mentioned earlier, so many non-Spanish composers were influenced by Spanish music, by the music they were hearing by Spanish composers in Spain and out of Spain. Um, many of these composers, I mean like Wolf, Italianist, or Spanishist Liedebuch, he wrote this entire thing of, like that translates to the Spanish Book of Songs, and they're all in German, of course. Um, Carmen. Georges Bizet, that's an entire opera, and if you've seen the show, you know. It's Spanish, <laughs> that's like the vibe. So the big debate question is, is it right that these non-Spanish composers are using Spanish spirit in their music? Which ones are doing it authentically? Which ones are making a caricature? What a great discussion. As I have mentioned, there were so many writers, composers, musicians, in this Spanish network in the Romantic era. Spanish dance forms, in particular, I think are very interesting. They played a large part in Spanish music, and they still do, I think. Um, you'll hear a lot of this influence in today's songs. I also think that it's interesting to discuss Spanish diction versus Italian diction, because often we say, oh, well, Italian is a great first song for a new singer because Diction isn't that hard, and it's easy to pronounce, and it's easy, and like, oh, there's these pure vowels, and it's so easy. Well, fun fact, Spanish has less pure vowels than Italian. Anyway, I'm not on one side or the other. But I just think it's interesting, and it's a discussion that we should have. And there are so many more things, so many more threads and paths that a researcher could take with all of this. I will take questions at this time. If anyone wants to interject with anything or has anything to say, 
Yeah, Ali. How did you come across this composer? What was your first interaction? Um, well, I emailed one Dr. Blair Salter, and I said, send me every Spanish composer you've ever heard of. And he was on the list. And I'm guessing that the reason that she knew about him is because there is one song of his, which you will hear today, it's my final song, that has a modern publication in an anthology, which also, you know how those anthologies have like, oh, this composer was this and this. It's the name and the one sentence thing again. Um, but I've been guessing that she knew his name because of that one song publication. Anyone else? Thoughts? Interjections? Can I ask another one? Mm -hmm. Going back to that loose threads thing, what's the one thing that you would like to continue? Oh man, I mean, who could ever know? How could I ever know? <laughs> I truly think that they are all I think that you have to research all of them a little bit in order mm -hmm. to dive into any of them specifically. And that's sort of how I've come across all of these. I think that the most accessible to me with the knowledge that I have now is the diction question because I know how Italian sounds and I generally know how Spanish sounds. And I've, that's something that I've sort of talked out loud quite a bit about. I also just really think that this idea of the regional variations is really fascinating. And I think I would guess that it is such a, such a, you have to go there and ask the people, like such a deep, deep lifelong research topic that would sort of need to be done. And I just think that's really wonderful, right? I think the whole purpose of all of this is to connect with people. And what better way than to go and be like, hey, person who I'm literally talking about, like, what is the deal? Yeah, right. Spanish has fewer pure vowels than Italian. Could you elaborate on that, please? Oh, boy. Yeah, um, so, Lord, did I prepare my vowels? I mean, in Spanish, you have A, E, I, O, U. That's five. In Italian, you also have, you have the uh, E versus E. So the open E and the closed E, that adds one. And then, uh, is it the like open O and the closed O? which makes seven. So all versus all. So in Spanish, both of those sort of mediate towards the middle a little, but with a little more closure um, on the A and the O generally. Okay. Yeah, Jacob. Um, you mentioned that this composer was in connection with a lot of other composers of the time. Is there anyone that you was or wasn't in I mean, I'll partially leave that up to you to decide when you hear the music. I think in order to answer you really well, I would need to do more sort of in-depth research into that. J I mean, just like off the top of my head, I think of Schubert. I don't really know if they were in connection, but just the way that Schubert was setting a gazillion texts and making a million songs, right? Not that Alvarez's output even comes close to to that, right? But I just think that his composition style is <clears throat> inclusive of the text, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment. It's inclusive of the text, like Schubert. It's extremely expressive in the piano, like Schubert and other German song composers. So yeah, I, I don't know if I could draw a direct parallel to, a, to one specific composer, um, but I will talk in just a minute about how overall he sort of combines a lot of aspects of German song and French song, if that can half answer your question. Yeah, Kelba. Um, is there um, what, what a record or what you find out about this repertoire today? Like, is it being performed uh, or is it famous enough in Spain or is it being, uh, or is it just being discovered? Yeah. Well, so the one that I mentioned that has a modern publication, there are a few recordings of that. Um, there is at least one recording, I believe, of all the songs you'll hear today. <laughs> um, I think it's an older recording. From what I can tell, 
other than maybe this one that has a modern publication. I can't find any like super recent, super great recordings of these pieces, which is part of the reason I wanted to perform them. I don't think that they're impossible to find recordings of, but I don't think that you exactly are going to find a lot of different options. If that answers your question. Yeah, so I know that when we talk about Italian, there's many different dialects of Italian within Italy. But when we sing, we choose the standard dialect of Tuscan to be sort of the go-to dialect. And you know, sometimes we get Venetian, Neapolitan, whatever, but Tuscan is kind of the go-to. Talking about just European Spanish, I know that Latin American Spanish has its own different dialects. Is there one regional dialect of European Spanish that is considered to be the standard for songs that are from European Spain? Yes, that's Castilian. And that's what you'll hear today. So generally, what I know of Castilian is just basically like you make the C's and the Z's into a th sound. And that's sort of the most, um, I guess, telling the most clearly you know that you're listening to Castilian Spanish, part of the um, linguistic experience. There are definitely some other subtleties. And there are certainly other dialects. Like, I don't know if I mentioned Catalonian or Catalan or not, um, but that's like a good example of a whole other language that feels like another dialect of Spanish, but is like decidedly different, but is spoken in Spain. And so it's interesting. But I would say Castilian is sort of the general, generally accepted, like if the composer's from Spain, you sing it with Castilian. If they're from South America or Central America or like anywhere else, you probably just sing it in not Castilian. <laughs> Uh, you said he was spent much of his childhood in Catalonia. Um, did he compose any in the Catalan language, or? I believe so. I believe he set texts in French and in Catalan. I have not seen them with my own eyes, but I believe that they could exist. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> One more. Um, do you think for? Does his art song that you have been exposed to, does it sort of use the Spanish idiom in music? Does it, does it sound Spanish in the way that is sort of like used by other composers as well? Or do you think it's sort of its own thing? I think that unlike some other non-Spanish composers, it sounds Spanish because that is its spirit instead of sounding Spanish for the sake of sounding exotic or sounding Spanish. Like Alvarez did not sit down and be like, I'm gonna make sure that this sounds <laughs> Spanish. He just wrote exciting music. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And I think that it will become so clear when you hear the music. If there are no further questions, then I'm going to talk briefly about the style of some of this music. So just generally, we know a little bit about French melody and German Lieder. Both of these translate to the word song in English. French melody prioritizes textual setting above all else, and it's often a bit lighter in mood and tone, particularly in, um, romantic, in the Romantic period, which we're talking about. Um, and it's often compared with German Lieder, which tends to prioritize piano and voice partnership, and is often a bit darker in mood. Now this is not to say that, you know, there's a million songs and a million varying styles, and these are two very general styles. And this is not to say that one completely ignores the things that the other prioritizes, and you understand what I'm saying. Um, so to me, just from these songs that I've been experiencing, Spanish song prioritizes melodic expression in the vocal line, and rhythmic expression. So this has to do with those dance forms that I mentioned. Alvarez clearly is taking inspiration from the French melody and German Lieder that he has heard. The text and the piano are both very important. And in my mind, he sort of finds a common ground between both of those things and adds in this sensitive settings. He's sensitive to the text and he is expressive with the melody in I think a unique way. I used this rubric to come up with difficulty ratings for each of the pieces that you'll hear today. The range, the tessitura, 
the support by the piano accompaniment, um, the difficulty of the text with a humongous deal <laughs> in these pieces. Um, and I gave them each an overall rating. So I'm going to tell you about these things for each of these pieces now, before you hear them. So the first piece you'll hear today is A Granada, which, hello, Granada, we saw you on the map. I gave this piece a 3.25. This is one of the more difficult pieces on the program, which it's a little bit of a, we love to put a showpiece as the opener and the closer, right? There you go. Um, it's a relatively long text. It includes a lot of idiomatic language. It references regional landmarks and specific places in Spain that if you just like put it into Google Translate, you're gonna be like, what is Candle Bell? I don't, what does that mean? I have no idea, you know? But it's like talking about a specific place. There's a lot of high tessitura singing, and it demands, um, the piece demands consistency and precision throughout the entire journey in the passaggio, um, which is hard, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the next piece you'll hear is Amor y Olvido. I gave this one a two. It's a bit simpler. Um, I think that it would be better for a college student, like an intermediate, I mean, I don't know, like a second year, perhaps a solid first year could sing this piece well. The challenge is keeping phrasal interest over several notes that are kind of the same and just sort of keeping things moving and that's something that's hard. There also is this meter change about halfway through, well, not halfway through, just like into the B section, which is a little difficult to line up if you're not super solid in how rhythms work. So without further ado, I would love to welcome my pianist, Joanne Yang, who has done an excellent job um, sensitively playing this piece.
I said this, but if you would please hold your applause <laughs> until the end of the very last piece, I would appreciate that. Thank you. So the next piece you'll hear is called A Una Morena. I gave this piece a 1.5. I think that this would also make a pretty great piece for a beginning to intermediate student. There is a high note at the end, which is hard for beginning students, but they gotta start somewhere, right? So <laughs> why not start them off right? This piece requires a sort of light and playful attitude and production in the voice that um, could be challenging, but also could be a great way to encourage students not to oversing and not to tire themselves out. There has to be efficient and quick breath, which you will notice. Yeah. The following piece is called Los Ojos Negros. This piece is just secretly maybe the hardest piece on the program, and I didn't expect that when I first laid my eyes upon the score. I gave it a 3.75. It's got a massive text. So many words. I didn't realize when I first picked the piece that there was a second verse. And by the time I get to the second verse, you'll be like, oh yeah, why on earth is there a second verse? <laughs> but we do what the music says, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of um, quick moving rhythmic figures, which if you're not familiar with classical music, we call this patter, very quick um, speech-like things on a lot of notes and a lot of words. There are very varying moods throughout this piece. Um, I have to sing so low in this, and I am a tenor. I don't sing low. But here we are, we do what the music says. And there has to be, partially because of these quick moving patter sections, there has to be a strong sense of independence from the accompaniment. So the singer has to really know exactly where they are in terms of the rhythm. So here is Atwana Morena. Oh, Reno. 
it's middling in difficulty. I think that's the best way to describe it. The challenges are phrasal interest, which I think is something that, you know, if I'm thinking of my own students, if I'm teaching a student who's a fourth year voice major, for example, I'm betting that they're gonna be working on phrasing. <laughs> I, I'm betting that everyone's always gonna be working on phrasing. So this is a great piece to work on that. There also is a need for textual interest because this piece is in two verses. And so you've gotta make the second verse more interesting than the first verse with a different text. There's also this eighth note situation and the singer is required to navigate higher portions of the voice on, well, eighth notes. So there needs to be a sense of weightlessness up there. Um, there's this term called parlando, just this sort of spoken singing style that sort of has to be utilized in this section. The final piece that you'll hear is called La Partida, which means the parting. I gave this piece a 3.25. Again, it is one of the more difficult pieces because we love a difficult opener and a difficult closer. <laughs> this piece takes breath control. Wow. There are some long phrases, there's a lot of motion going on, and you've got to know where your breath is for this to happen. <clears throat> the intro and the outro sections require strong senses of rhythm from the singer. Um, you will hear that there is no piano beneath what I am doing for a time, and so I have to know precisely, well, precisely where I'm going and precisely where I am in my own music at all times. And that's hard for beginning singers. It's hard for all singers. <laughs> there also has to be, just like I believe um, the first piece, this sort of effortless traversal of the passaggio. It just, Alvarez just really likes to walk right up into the highest parts of your voice. And if you know anything about how the voice like mechanically works, that's hard. <laughs> you can put that in your pedagogy books. <laughs> so without further ado, here are the final two songs.
Dr. Spivey and Meister Edelstein. Thank you for your support and for being here um, for all of this. And I cannot worship the ground that Joanne Yang walks in, <laughs> uh, in my daily life. Um, <laughs> you, you heard the piano, right? Like, that was awesome. That's like half the songs are piano. Yeah, um, and of course, thank you all for coming. Thank you for my friends for running technology. Thank you for my other friends who aren't running technology. <laughs> Thank you for all of my other friends and everyone who came. Um, I am excited to see faces that I don't know. That's my favorite part. Um, and I mean, if you have any questions or whatever, like I'm happy to answer them. And otherwise, you're, you mm -hmm. can go. <laughs>